Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and thank you for joining me on this Monday morning. Uh, Today, I'm going to be uh, giving you a little special offering. Uh, We'll get into that in a second. Uh, But before I did that, I wanted to share with you a little experience that I had yesterday. Um, I got a text, and every once in a while, I get texts from uh, my mother um, about the Bible and about Jesus and about God. Now, she has stopped uh, really communicating with me about it because, of course, she knows my stance. Um, But every once in a while, she uh, tries to bring it up again. Now, our relationship is great. You know, we talk a lot. I go over. We have dinner. Everything's great. Um, And she's awesome. She's the best. But, you know, every once in a while, it's like she gets this urge to send me a message about how much Jesus loves me and everything. And, you know, it's kind of frustrating because um, at the same token, she admitted that she does listen to my teachings. So so she's probably listening to this right now. Hi, mom. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a little frustrating because I am far more diligent in the scriptures than, than she is or that, that she probably knows of, right? She, she probably doesn't even realize how diligent and honest and consistent I try to be in the scriptures. So to get a message, you know, oh, it was a John Piper teaching. Now, you guys probably remember John Piper. Um, I, uh, I used to listen to a little bit of his work back in my futurist days before I knew much about the Bible. And uh, he's that guy that's, you know, animated and flails his arms around and acts like he's, you know, praising God while he's preaching and stuff. But the guy doesn't have a clue, right? He's clueless. He totally ignores all, all time statements. He ignores everything that Jesus said about how his coming was in that generation and before some standing there died. He ignores all the prophetic, uh, all the uh, uh, apostles' statements about how the, the resurrection was about to take place and the judge was at the door and everything was at hand and the age was coming to an end and the end of all things is at hand and this world is passing away and uh, Revelation saying everything in this book is at hand and about to take place and shortly to come to pass. He ignores it all, right? Totally, totally ignores it all because the time statements to a guy like that are very, very um, dangerous, right? Because John Piper would be one of the leading, um, you know, uh, Christian pastors and teachers in probably America, if not the world, as far in terms of popularity and whatnot. And of course, he's making a damn good living. Um, doing what he's doing, right? Between his speaking, between his teaching, between his probably his mega church that he takes home boatloads of money in. Um, you know, this would be a very uh, bad thing for him to acknowledge the time statements, just like any other big, um, you know, evangelist or, well, I shouldn't say evangelist, but um, because they don't evangelize really, but the teachers, you know, the pastors. It would be very, very bad to acknowledge and put any sort of focus on the time statements, really. So, um, you know, when she sent me this link, I kind of chuckled and said, oh, good Lord, here we go, John Piper, I'm going back to my futurist days, right? And, and I'm so far beyond that, so far past that, that I wouldn't even bother looking at this guy's stuff anymore, all right? And some people might say, oh, that's because you're cocky. No, it's just because I've progressed honestly and unbiasedly and diligently, and I've got to where I've got um, because of that, right? And I'm not going to go back to the muck of confusion when I'm in clarity now. Things actually make sense. Things line up. I don't have to wonder about passages. I don't have to ignore time statements. I don't have to ignore Jesus saying he only came for Israel. Everything fits perfectly, right? So just because I'm unhappy about, I might be unhappy about certain uh, implications of a certain view doesn't mean that I have to go back to the muck of futurism. All right. Certain people do that, but not me. Okay. So uh, anyway, she was going on and on and we had a text battle back and forth. And, you know, then she started, I started asking her certain questions about the Bible and, and, and saying like, hey, can you explain this, whatever. And she, love her to death, but she ignores my questions, right? She doesn't have answers. Um, and I even said, well, let's sit together and discuss the Bible. Well, that, that doesn't fly either because of course she knows that, you know, I know my way around the Bible pretty well and, uh, that probably wouldn't go so well for her. So, um, instead what I get is kind of a barrage of text saying like, I'm pleading the blood over you and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, God is going to change you and you're going to do mighty works for the gospel and like, oh, you know, all this stuff. You're right back. I'm right back in you know, where I was before. And it's just kind of frustrating, you know. Um, And like I said, love my mom to death. There's not a better mom on planet Earth. And I'm super grateful and thankful to the real God um, that that he provided me with a mom as such. But um, when it comes to ignorance, uh, man, it's tough. It's real tough. 
So uh, yeah, that was kind of how my day went a little bit yesterday. And that happens once every few months. You know, my mom texts me saying like, she's afraid that I'm going to hell and you know, and I need to repent and all this stuff. And um, at the end of the day, folks, it comes down to, okay, what does the Bible actually say? You know, like, because if you take the Bible out of commission, right? If the Bible, let's just say the Bible didn't exist, never came to be, right? My mom, every Christian on planet earth, every single person who's ever put their faith in Jesus would not believe in Jesus, right? They wouldn't because the Bible is the sole source of their faith. It, it, it directs them. It shows them what they are to believe. It gives them all these, these things that they believe in, these concepts and these doctrines and everything. And so without that book, okay, if that book wasn't there, there would be no belief in Jesus, all right? Because that's the book that tells people about Jesus, right? The Savior of Israel. So the uh, the irony is, is that she's telling me that I'm going to hell, yet I'm the one who understands and knows the Bible, right? Not her, right? She, she reads, she'll read a couple chapters, whatever, but she doesn't study, you know, like she's not in the history. She's not studying it deeply. She's not put piecing things together with the Old Testament. She's not diligently searching the scriptures to make sure the things that she believes are so. You know, she's not not taking into account the historical background of Israel as we get to the last days and how they were literally Israelites all spread abroad, paganized, worshiping idols, the work of men's hands. And God was now having mercy upon them and calling them back and remembering the covenant that he made with their fathers. None of that is taken into consideration with most people, my, my wonderful mother included. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of um, ignorance when they get to the Bible and they start jamming themselves into it. And fortunately enough for me, I was able to come out of it, you know, just maybe five or six years into my delusion, which isn't very much, right? I was able to see this stuff clearly before I began digging myself so deep that I could never climb out of it. You know, when you're 40, 50 years in like she is, um, you know, it gets really difficult to pull yourself out and not many are willing to do it. Okay. Not many are willing to do it. Um, and, and I've always said this, you know, I get it. I understand that when you're that age and you've done something a certain way your whole life, um, you know, you don't want to consider new things. You don't want to consider that you might have gotten it wrong, right? Because that's, that can be a scary thing. Um, but for me personally, I don't, it doesn't matter to me, right? It ma what matters to me is, okay, am I, am I being honest to this book? That's it. That's all that matters to me. Am I being honest to the words of the book? Am I looking at the entire story for what it says? Am I taking into account the backstory? Am I putting it all together completely so that I, I can explain it cohesively, sensibly, logically? And the answer is yes. Okay, the answer is yes. Now, when I was in futurism, the answer was no. <laughs> when I was in futurism, I ignored all time statements. I had no clue about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. I had no clue about the end of the age. I had bar barely any clue about the dispersions of Israel out into the nations and how literally every single Old Testament text speaks about Israelites out in the nations. Every single Old Testament prophet, folks, speaks about Israelites out in the nations right? Struggling out in the nations, being preserved out in the nations, being taken care of by God out in the nations, being brought back by the from the nations, God sending a light to the nations to gather them back. I mean, it's all over the Old Testament. So the audacity and the nerve of someone to come to the New Testament and see a statement from Jesus that says, I come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and then to assume that that doesn't mean what he said, and that doesn't match the consistent you know, things that we have in the Old Testament about Israelites in the nations and coming back and being redeemed from the hand of their enemies. You got to be real crazy to do such a thing, right? Me, no. I like to take what it says for face value. I don't get tripped up by trigger words like Gentile. I keep the context in mind as I go through the story. And I see that Paul's end goal was all Israel saved. All right. And that only the 144,000, the 12 tribes were singing the redemption song in the end, right? It all makes perfect sense. And then, of course, Jesus's Trump statement there, I come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, makes perfect sense when you start seeing it, okay? But with all that said, I just hope that as she continues to listen, as everyone continues to listen, right? Because a lot of my detractors and haters are always here. They're always listening. 
Um, they're always checking in. They're always, you know, commenting and saying certain things. But the reason why they're always here is because they understand that what I'm saying is not that far fetched, right? It makes sense, okay? Especially given the fact that this God, supposedly of Israel, who cares so much about people, has just left people in the complete dark for the last two thousand years since prophecy and revelation ended screechingly, I might add, at AD 70 and the destruction of the temple. All right, there is nothing, all right? There's no revelation, there's no new prophets, there's no nothing, there's no no Holy Spirit, right? Um, no, no miracles, no signs, no wonders, nothing. Just emotions, that's really it, and um, goose pimples when music comes on. But uh, yeah, so hopefully, uh, you know, through listening and being honest, more people will come around and see that what I'm saying is not... Uh, it's not deception. It's not me trying to deceive people. It's not me being deceived. It's me being completely honest with the Bible. And again, if I am being honest with the Bible and if what I'm showing actually works better in the Bible than what you're showing, then that means that my view is correct and yours isn't. Okay, that's just the, that's just the, the nuts and bolts of it all, isn't it? If what I'm presenting, if my my synopsis of the Bible makes more sense of the Bible and fits better with the details and, and statements given in the Bible, then my position is more accurate than yours, okay? And, and I am confident that there aren't many uh, positions, if any, that honor what the Bible says as much as covenant Israel only does, okay? Um, but enough about all that, folks, okay? What we're going to do today is we're going to look, we'll li listen, okay? I'm going to share a 30, let's see, it's 33 minutes, 34 minute long audio that was done by Matthew Simon. Excuse me. Now, Matthew Simon was a Christian at one point. He um, was a universalist for many years, and then he uh, is now Israel only. And uh, I guess his transition into Israel only has taken place over the last maybe couple months, from what I gather, but um, you know, Matthew and I had known each other a little bit on Facebook, you know, over the last maybe five years or so. Um, communicated a few times, actually had a couple bump head moments where you know I didn't necessarily agree with his universal approach of the gospel and salvation, and you know that led to a little bit of hostility between us. Nothing, nothing bad. Like I mean, trust me, there's way worse. Um, but you know, enough where I think we we didn't communicate with each other at that point. But um, brilliant guy, smart guy, very well spoken. I think he lives in India or somewhere. I'm not quite sure. Matthew, um, uh, maybe if you could clarify that for us in the comments, I'd appreciate that. But um, he, uh, he's been you know, reaching out and, and telling people that he's now IO and that he gets it and he understands it. And so he put out this audio last week about the uh, thousand year reign, the resurrection, the new heaven and new earth and Israel only. Um, and it's just a wonderful um, brief synopsis done by Matthew. And, and I, it's done so well that I wanted to share it um, on my channel so that people could hear it from someone else, right? I mean, we all come here to, uh, to hear the, the truth of IO and hear the Bible explained in an unbiased way. Um, but, you know, sometimes it gets annoying listening to the same old voice, that being me. Um, and so it's always nice when I can share somebody's work on here um, and it not be too long, right? I know David King did a wonderful teaching on the, the world that God so loved, right? Who the world is in context. And I, I want to uh, share that to my channel. It's just the, the way that I do things, I have to record it. I have to tie up my phone and my laptop. And it's like a two and a half hour long um presentation. So I'm still working on doing that. Maybe what I'll do is I'll split it up into parts. I don't know yet, but I want to get that teaching up there because I think it's just a, a wonderful job done by David King. Um, but that hopefully will come in the future. But but this was perfect. 34 minutes long, uh, real crystal clear. Now, obviously him and I are in agreement on most things. Okay. The only thing that I will say is because it's my channel and I have to make sure that people know this going in is that he and I would differ. Um, in one point on this. And, and that point is when he starts talking. I think it's at the end and he may mention it once or twice in the middle. But at the very end, maybe the last three, four or five minutes, he talks about how he believes that because Jesus removed the law for Israel, that that somehow makes all people righteous. OK, and that that somehow had an effect that the removal of the law and what Christ's work was for Israel somehow had an effect on all humanity. Therefore, all humanity is righteous now. Um, now, I wouldn't be able to agree with that because I don't see that Christ's work was relative to humanity at all. 
Okay, I see that Christ's work was only relative to Israel, the lost sheep. Um, and um, I don't see how I can make that connection. Now, am I going to condemn the guy for it? No, of course not. If that's his belief, that's fine, right? At least he's honest enough to understand and admit that the text and the contextual details and the, the, the details of the narrative are all Israel only, right? And the salvation and the mission was Israel and they were seeking them from the nations. Like he gets it, right? So I'm not going to split hairs over something like that, all right? If that's how he believes, that's fine. Personally, I, I don't. Um, subscribe to that sort of conclusion on the story. I sort of separate the story from reality and say, okay, you know, the story is, is what it is, whether it's a myth, an IO myth all about Israel, or whether it really did happen that way, whatever it was, Jesus was clearly all for Israel and his work um, removed their curse. And that was that. Um, and then on the side of that, as a greater truth, I hold that there is a true God who, um, interacts and loves and cares for people in whatever capacity that is. I don't claim to know. I just know that it's true because I've experienced it. Um, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't lump those two things together. I, I see the Bible as possibly being myth. I, I actually kind of lean that way now, now that I see the end of it and the rapture of the saints up into the sky, which never, you know, was never recorded and all these things. Um, so I kind of take that route, but I do, of course, believe in a, a God. I don't know that I could say that we're all perfectly righteous, um, because I don't know that we were ever, you know, unrighteous. I don't know that we were ever, um, in need of righteousness. I don't even know that that's relative to humanity, right? Like how, how am I to say, or who am I to say that, you know, humanity, um, needed righteousness in the first place, right? I mean, I don't know. Um, all I know is that I, I, I received an answer from a, a gracious um, God and, and I was filled with peace and I felt unconditional love um, in a day when I really needed it. And, you know, and that was pretty much the moment that set me on a course for truth and to discover spiritual things. And unfortunately, I was kind of thrown right into Christianity based upon my upbringing. Um, and really, when I got into the Bible, that's when I started to lose my peace, you know, like I started to become so obsessed with understanding like what this bizarre story that really doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because it's dealing with ancient times and it's mentioning people and the time statements are all, you know, at hand and everything. And here I am 2000 years later and I'm reading it. And I'm saying, all right, how do I fit into this thing? Like, how can I, you know, adjust these statements so that it makes more sense to me here in 2000 and 11 or whenever it was, right? And so that's just kind of what happens with people. But thankfully, I've been able to come out of it. And so has Matthew here. And uh, so I just wanted to share this with you guys. He's a great speaker, very clear. Um, and uh, just a real nice guy too, right? Like this is a nice, nice guy. Like I'll admit that sometimes I can be an asshole. Um, I really don't have patience for, for stupidity and for wannabes because I, let's not forget, folks, I've been dealing with this for two years, Right? I was the first outspoken voice of IO, all right? And so imagine the, the backlash that I've gotten, not only here on YouTube with the you know hundreds of comments I get each month, um, but also in emails and texts and different things from people that I once communicate. I mean, you know, it keeps you busy. So you see the arguments, you see the stupidity. Um, and so I have a lesser uh, threshold for it, I guess you would say, um, now having been dealing with this stuff for two years. Um, but Matthew is just very um, nice, he's kind, he uh, is soft-spoken, so a totally different approach. Um, and I think, I'm hoping that people like my mom and others will listen to this and might listen to him more than they would listen to me, right? Because I can come off as kind of harsh sometimes. And of course, with my mom, she's probably looking at me like, oh, he's just my son, he doesn't know much, you know, but... Um, yeah, so hopefully this reaches some people. I'm sure it will. Matthew does a great job in explaining the basics of IO. And uh, so I'm, without further ado, I'm going to let this play and I'll try to come back on at the end for a few closing remarks. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matthew Simon, here he is. Hey everybody, this is Matthew. And I know it's been a long time since I made a video. And the reason for that is, you know, I've been doing uh, some soul searching and Bible investigation uh, studying some of the topics that have been bothering me uh, for the last one or two years. Questions that I've been asking myself, but not really, you know, getting to that final conclusion. And, you know, um, by God's grace, and I think I've got a better idea of some of these topics that I put here on the, in the list. The thousand year reign, the resurrection, the new heaven and earth, Israel only. These are some of the topics that I've been, you know, I've been studying these last 
one month, um, and I'd like to talk to you about that. So, uh, you know, so the last one month, you know, I've been looking at some of these things, you know, I mean, and these have been triggered by questions, and I believe God has just ordained this in my life, trying to uh, understand this and, you know, get to the le next level of understanding, to more, to have more clarification, more clarity uh, in the scripture. So, you know, one thing as, uh, you know, I want to thank, uh, especially Jason DeCosta and David King from YouTube and Facebook, respectively, um, for, you know, some of the things that they've been talking about. It helped me understand, uh, you know, and, you know, in my search for an honest answer to a lot of these questions. Um, so I want to just share with you, right, what I've been uh, learning so, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've been, you know, whenever I talk to futurists, and I've had some conversations with futurists um, recently, and basically their answer, their question is, when I tell them that, hey, you know, the judgment day is over in 70 AD, and, you know, it's all about universal salvation right now, and, you know, everybody's going to heaven, and many of them just find it very hard to believe, and, and the reason they say is, you know, there are a few things, right, they, one day they say is, Hey, if the, if the judgment already happened in 1780, wasn't that only for Israel? What about the rest of the nations? Then they ask, you know, if, is this the new heaven and earth? Uh, then how come there is no, you know, how come we still have death and pain and tears? The other thing they say, well, if the resurrection already happened, how come nobody saw it happening? You know, how come there's no historic evidence for any of these things? And then, you know, what happened to the thousand year uh, reign of Christ, or the millennium? Uh, where did that, when did that happen, right? So, you know, and as a preterist, uh, some of the, you know, the, you know maybe as preterists, we say you know, everything is already over. Uh, we say that, you know, the resurrection was the spiritual, you know, that's why nobody saw it. We say that the new heaven and earth is spiritual, and, you know, there's no death, pain, or tears. Um, spiritually speaking, there's no judgment, no curse. But, you know, if you still have problems in life, and eventually, you know, we all go to heaven. Uh, and then we talk about, you know... Um, the thousand year reign, well, you know, some preterists say that it, it was between the cross and 70 AD, that was a thousand year reign. And then I myself, uh, I never I never believed that, you know, what I, I, that was something I just could not be convinced, I could not see that in the scripture. And I, well, I clearly saw that the millennium started at 70 AD, but at the same time, I felt that everything was finished in 70 AD, so then I thought, you know, the millennium was just this short period, you know, of maybe a day or two, you know, I mean, uh, it was just a spiritual thing. Again, you know, going back to spiritualization. I thought the millennium was purely spiritual, and then on an earthly term, it really didn't have uh, anything more than one day. You know, like a day is a thousand years. You know, I use that logic in a funny way. Um, and then uh, I said that, yes, 1780 was a judgment, and it was only for those under the law, uh, and that's why, you know, that all happened in Jerusalem. But, uh, you know, it's only recently I, I found out this thing about Israel only, and... Uh, um, you know, I studied the scriptures and I came to find out a lot of what they say is right. Uh, you know, if you look at it, uh, you know, first of all, you know, you look at Jesus, you know, when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10 and I think Matthew 15, he says that, you know, he's he's only been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Um, you know, and, and the, uh, the idea that we've had is that, well, the Gentiles are, you know, anybody who is not a Jew and, you know, and and that's the question of future. They said, well, how come, you know, the gospel really was never preached to the entire Gentile world? It was only preached uh, in that time, in the first century, to only places where there were Jews. And that's what the scripture clearly shows. So then they asked the question, well, how is it possible, right, that, you know, the end came? How come, you know, the, 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 the judgment day already happened? And so when Israel only is what helped me understand and have a clarity on that, right? Because Jesus clearly said he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And then he said that he had other sheep in the in the fold, um, who he had to get, in the, you know, uh, and those sheep that were scattered. You know, the, the high priest said that Jesus would die for the nation of Israel and also for those children who were scattered abroad. Um, and, and a big thing for me was, you know, who were the Gentiles? Right? And I found in Romans, uh, you know, we always assume that Romans is written to Gentiles. But if you look at Romans chapter 4, he says it's written to the descendants of Abraham in the flesh. And it talks about Romans 7, he said, those who know the law. And Romans 9 was a clincher where it says, he talks about the Gentiles being the people who were rejected by God. He quotes Hosea 1 and Hosea 2, and he says that it's actually the lost tribes of Israel. Now, you know, I 
personally never studied this history of Israel in the Old Testament, but when I did study it, I saw, found that Israel, under David and Solomon, were uh, all twelve tribes were united under the king kingdom of David and then Solomon, and after that, they split into two kingdoms: the, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, and the two tribes in the southern kingdom. And basically, the Assyrians, uh, you know, destroyed the northern kingdom and scattered them all over, you know, the, the nations. And then, you know, the Babylonians came and attacked the southern kingdom and destroyed Jerusalem and, and burned down the temple. And they were taken into captivity for 70 years and then they came back and were restored by God. And then again, if you look later on, the Greeks uh, ruled over, you know, the, the, the Middle East. And then, you know, many Israelites were scattered uh, because they gave up the law of Moses and became uncircumcised and became mixed with the pagans. And, and, and then, basically, if you look, in the Bible it says that the new covenant is being made in the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 8 and Jeremiah chapter 32. So that kind of makes sense that the Gentiles were really nobody but the lost tribes of Israel. And that is why, you know, the gospel is only preached to those places where those lost tribes of Israel are found, those Gentiles. The Gentile really meant the uncircumcised. And, you know, I was wondering, well, if the law was only given to Israel, why would God condemn all these pagans in India and China and Australia and, and the Americas? Like, they don't even know anything about the law of Moses. Why would God condemn them, right? So, obviously, the law of Moses was, you know, condemning those Gentiles who were previously under the law. They were became uncircumcised and uh, they were scattered in the nations. And that's why Jesus said that he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, you know, belonging to all those 12 tribes. And then Paul was sent into those, uh, you know, nations in, in in the Roman Empire and speaking, you know, those who speak, who were speaking Greek, uh, they were these lost tribes of Israel who were uncircumcised, but yet they had the law in their hearts. You know, they knew the Ten Commandments and they still wanted to please God by faith. And that's why Paul, when he goes to the synagogue, he is preaching to the Jew and to the God-fearing Gentile, the dead Gentile who knew the God of Israel. I mean, how would the, 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 the pagan living in India or China or, or you know, somewhere in some remote tribe in Africa, how would he know the God of Israel? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? He, there's no way he would know that God. Right? Um, that, because God never revealed himself to those people. God only revealed himself to Israel. He only made his covenant with Israel. No other nation knew him. And therefore all the other nations were innocent. Right? They were not under the law. They were not under the curse of the law. Only those who were under the law were under the curse of the law. That's why Jesus came in Galatians chapter 4. It says that Jesus was born under the law to redeem those under the law. Uh, he came to save them from under the law. They were under the curse. So, uh, so that's when I realized, and if you look at Revelation, it says clearly that you know only the 144,000 were redeemed from the earth, from the 12 tribes of Israel. Only they had the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Only they, you know, in, in Acts chapter 2 and Joel chapter 3 and 2, it says, you know, they were the ones who received the Holy Spirit and there was salvation in Zion and in Jerusalem, right? Uh, salvation from the destruction of Jerusalem. So that's why 70 AD makes sense that, you know, that the Bible is all about Israel, you know. Revelation 14, it says only the 144,000 knew the song of redemption. Like nobody else knew the song of salvation, only the 144,000. You look at the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and earth, the new Jerusalem, it only has the 12 tribes of Israel's names on it, only the 12 apostles. And Jesus said in Matthew 19 that when he came in a second coming, that the 12 apostles would sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Nobody else was judged. So, and it makes sense because only Israel had the law and Jesus came only to save those under the law. In Hebrews chapter 8, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 9 it says that Christ died as a ransom for the sins committed under the old covenant. He came to make a new covenant with those under the old covenant. His first coming was to those under the law. His second coming was to save them from the judgment of the law in 70 AD. So it all makes sense. This is all about Israel. right? That's, that's how we can make sense. That 70 AD was, you know, was a judgment day of the world. And that world there, you know, John 3.16 said, God so loved the world, for he gave his only son and uh, only begotten son, whoever would believe would not perish. Now what is the world? And in Hebrews it says that Jesus died at the end of the world. At what world ended? You know, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul told them that, you know, the world is coming to an end. And 1 Corinthians 10, it gives the identity of who is he talking to. And he says that, you, my brethren, are, you know, you, your ancestors were in Egypt. They came out of Egypt by following Moses and were in the wilderness for 40 years. In the same way, we are 
going to the same way and those things were written as examples for us so that upon whom the end of the age has come, the end of the world or the end of the age. It's talking about the age. It's, you know, God loved that old covenant world of Israel because they were under the law and Jesus came and died for them. So that's why I kind of, I do believe in the Israel only uh, thing. Now, obviously, does that mean that, you know, am I saying that, you know, what about us today, right? Well, I, I believe that we are born righteous, we are born perfect because if you look at the Bible, it doesn't tell anything about anything after 70 AD. It doesn't talk about what happened to the people after 70 AD, right? It doesn't say about what's our uh, what's our uh, destiny, but you know, from my own personal experience, you know, knowing God personally, and I see a lot of other people, atheists and Hindus who have had miraculous experiences, they all know this God of unconditional love. So, and, and God has showed me that He has told me that in all my struggles of depression under the Christian religion, He has showed me that I am righteous, I am perfect, flawless, born righteous, uh, and because Jesus removed the law, you know, there's no curse, there's no judgment, because of Him, we are born righteous. And uh, that's what I believe in and I still hold to that, you know. Um, now, here's the thing. <laughs> Uh, you know what about the resurrection and the new heaven and earth? Because that's a big problem, right? Because you know, as futurists, they, the reason they, they they look forward to future judgment is because the resurrection has not happened. There's no historical record of any resurrection, right? Because of the Bible, the end of the Bible in the 70 AD second coming of Christ is supposed to be this mass resurrection of all these people under the law, all these Israelites, you know, the righteous and the wicked, and this great judgment in the second coming and. And if you look, there is no historic evidence of anything like that of having taken place. And then what, as preterists, you know, as full preterists uh, like myself and others have been saying, well, that we've been saying that that resurrection is spiritual. And that, you know, nobody saw it. It's all in the spirit. And, you know, that we are all, you know, we are all born, uh, you know, we are already resurrected. And, you know, it's not a physical resurrection. It's all spiritual. Our spirits have been resurrected. But the problem is that's not what the Bible says. You know, when I study the Bible honestly and just try to be honest and try to just study the Bible for what it says, um, that is not what it says. It basically, you know, if you look in Daniel chapter 12, the, the hope of Israel was that there would be a time of resurrection in the, during the time of tribulation when Michael the archangel stood up, that's Jesus, you know, who stood up for his people. And then those who are in the dust would be raised some to everlasting life and others to everlasting shame. And then Paul wrote in Acts, uh, where he wrote, uh, Paul, sorry, he mentioned in Acts that the hope of the 12 tribes of Israel was the resurrection. And when he's talking about resurrection, he talks about, you know, Christ being the first fruit. In 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about what is that resurrection. He talks about just like in Adam all died. Uh, all, of, all will be made alive in Christ and he talks about Christ being the first first fruit and they would you know the brethren of Christ would be resurrected just like him now how was Jesus resurrected he was not resurrected spiritually he was resurrected physically in a body like he died and then after three days he rose in the same body yes and that body was a glorified body it was a, it was a spiritual body in the sense that it wasn't flesh and blood and Paul said that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God so today if to say that we are already resurrected and you know, our body's flesh and blood dies, you know, our flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul said, that the earthly body does not inherit heaven. Our fleshly body does not go to heaven. So gee, Paul said that they were expecting, you know, in a twinkling of an eye, they would be changed to immortality. They would receive immortal bodies. They would receive the glorious heavenly body. The body of Jesus. Just like Jesus was raised from the dead in a body, they would also be raised from the dead. The dead in Christ would rise first in First Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. And then we who are alive and remain would be caught up in the air in the clouds. So they were talking about a literal being caught up in the clouds, literally to be with the dead. Um, and you know, throughout in Philippians chapter 3 says, you know, when Jesus comes, you know, we, we are waiting for a savior from heaven who will transform our lowly earthly bodies into his glorious form. In John, First uh, John, I believe in one of those chapters, it says that when Jesus appears, we will be like Him. When we when we see Him, we will become just like His appearance. So they were going to become glorified just like Jesus. And 
And Jesus appeared in his glorified body to, you know, to Paul on the road to Damascus, and he appeared to John when he wrote the book of Revelation. So they would receive that glorified immortal body. Jesus said in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, he said that when in the resurrection, they, none of them would marry again, but they would be like angels in heaven. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7 that the world is going to end and let those who are not married, let them not get married, you know, let, you know, the world is passing away, do not focus on marriage and possessions, you know, sell all their possessions if possible, don't get married. And why? Because they were waiting for that new age, the age to come where they would be like angels, as Jesus said, they would be like angels in heaven. And, uh, but you look at today, you know, we're all still getting married, we're not like angels and our body still dies. So obviously, you know, we are not resurrected beings. And, you know, we are still in the flesh and blood. So obviously that promise was never made to us. And that promise was already done. It's, you know, a literal resurrection is the, is the prophecy of the Bible. That was what was promised to Israel. So then going back to the, you know, is, a, is this a new heaven and earth? You know, again, we have spiritualized it and say, well, yeah, this is the new covenant world, the new heaven and earth. And there is no judgment. That is true. There is no judgment. But... We are really not the new heaven and earth because we still experience death and pain and suffering. And they were looking forward to a new heaven and earth where righteousness dwelt, but there was no evil. And there was no more death, pain or tears in Revelation 21. Peter said that they were looking for a new heaven and earth when the old heaven and heaven and earth was destroyed by fire. They were looking for a new Jerusalem where there was righteousness, where there was no evil. But they would be like God. They would be like Jesus, seated on thrones. They would be reigning and ruling with Christ. Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation says that they were the kingdom of priests who would rule and reign with Christ and that new heaven and earth, new Jerusalem is only with the 12 tribes of Israel, only with 144,000. There's nobody else there. So, you know, the, the truth is that, you know, we are not really part of the new heaven and earth, you know, if you think of it. So, you know, when I look at these things, honestly, there was a bodily resurrection that was prophesied a new heaven and earth where there was no more death, pain or tears uh, there was no more curse all that stuff you know and the more I think of it you know there's only two possibilities when you think of it you look at the history of the church and after 70 AD when you read the history of the church there is no information for a good 50 to 100 years there's nothing there's silence there's no letters from the apostles there's no scriptures all the scriptures ended in 70 AD there's no scripture written after that telling none of the apostles wrote scriptures saying that hey the second coming has happened the judgment is over and this is the new heaven there's no trace of that there's silence um, I read a work from Ed Stevens in about this and it, it's very accurate what he's saying is that it seems like the only possibility is that the entire church you know the, the, the most of the church in those days they were the martyrs they were martyred they were killed and they all died and very few of them were alive and they were raptured and they were you know, resurrected uh, physically they were caught up in the clouds and they went off with Jesus into the new heaven and earth and basically there's no trace of anybody and what we have today is Christianity that was formed in the 2nd and the 3rd century was basically formed out of that chaos like nobody knew what happened all we have is people who were left behind who were not really part of that church maybe they were pagans maybe they were like you know non-Israelites who they found the scriptures, they heard about these things and and they basically formed a religion in the 3rd century the church fathers, you know, so-called church fathers, uh, they formed this religion and what we have today is 45,000 denominations and of confusion and nobody really has any clue of what's happened. So that's a, that is a possibility that, you know, the resurrection happened and nobody saw it. So that's the thing that's bothering me, like, well, you know, if the resurrection happened and nobody saw it, there's no trace of it. There's only two things possible. One is that it never happened, right? That this entire story, there is some problem in this, that, you know, maybe this part of it is not true. There's no evidence, there's no historic evidence. Uh, and when I look at today, the, the church of today, they have no power. Nobody's able to follow Jesus. Nobody's able to be perfect as Jesus commanded. Nobody's able to obey Christ. Nobody's able to do the same miracles that Jesus commanded. Jesus said in John 14 12 that those who believe in him would do the same miracles, would do, do even more than what he did. Uh, Jesus commanded perfection and nobody's able to do that. And you know, we look at Christians today, we're the same as anybody else. You know, there are good and bad people in every religion. So then the question is asked is like, one is did the resurrection really happen? And was it like, you know, I believe in there's two, only two possibilities. One, that the resurrection happened is only for Israel 
the entire thing is over. They're all in the new heaven and earth, and we're not part of that. And you know, when we die, our spirits will go to God, and there's no judgment. And you know, at the end of our life, when we die, our spirits will go to God, and you know, we will see Him face to face, and we'll be, uh, you know, uh, they'll be enjoying His love and peace, and and there's no judgment for anybody post 70 AD. Um, but we will not be glorified like Christ. We will not be glorified like those New Jerusalem, like those 12 tribes of Israel. Or the other option is that, you know what? Maybe none of this really happened. Maybe the resurrection, that great hope they were looking for, really never happened. And that maybe Jesus only came to just destroy the law, remove that sin, remove that curse, so that after 70 AD, everybody just goes to heaven. And that's what I'm leaning more towards that because, you know, when I look at my experience, when God showed me that I am righteous, I'm flawless and perfect, and my faith is nothing compared to the Bible, my conclusion has to be that, you know, that resurrection probably never happened, and maybe that was just something they were hoping for, and it really never happened. Now, um, irrespective of that, the good news is that, you know, I'm not tying myself to the Bible anymore. I'm like, Yes, the Bible is about Israel, it's about the law, it's about Jesus who saved them, and whatever may have happened. I look at this as that God is love, and God is unconditional love. And in the Bible is, unfortunately the Bible is not condi unconditional love, because the Bible is all about the law. As you see from the time of Adam, God gave conditions, right? I mean, told him, you know, you have to uh, eat, you know, don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that was a law. And then from that time on, it's all law. They're, you know, Abraham is under a covenant. Israel is under a covenant. Uh, Jesus comes to make a covenant. They have to believe in Jesus to be saved. And, and, and they have to obey Christ. And it's all about covenants, all commandments, all covenant. It's a covenant. The entire Bible is about God's covenant with Israel. The Bible is not written to us. We are not part of those covenants. And I look at it, the God that I know, <clears throat> experienced in my life, is a God of unconditional love, who is my Father who loves me. And that's why I say, Daddy, God loves you. And that he has made, he has, you are born righteous and that he doesn't find any flaw in you. You are perfect. You are spotless. Because we are spiritual beings. God is spirit and we are spiritual beings living in this flesh. And in, our, in the spirit we are perfect and righteous and holy and blameless. And that's why, you know, uh, you know, when we die, we all go to heaven. So that kind of contradicts with the Bible, if you think of it. So the more I look at it, you know, when I look at the evidence that Hey, there's no evidence of any resurrection. There's no evidence of any miracles today. It's, you know, there's no authenticity. I'm beginning to believe that you know the God that I know. I believe in that God, the unconditional loving God, my daddy God. I believe in Him rather than the Bible God of Israel, the God of the law. I, I don't want to believe it. Yes, I do believe in that Jesus was real. I believe, you know, I I, I believe it. You know, I don't want to throw away the scriptures. You know, I don't want to. But I do, there are problems in the scripture. And I want to show you the next problem, the thousand year reign. You know, um, many futurists ask me, well, what about the thousand year reign? When did that happen? And, you know, some preterists will say that the thousand years began at the cross in 30 AD and ended in 70 AD. The problem with that is I don't buy that. It just does not pass the scriptural uh, truth. Because in Revelation 20, it says there are two resurrections. It says Revelation 19 and 18, it talks about the destruction of Babylon, which is Jerusalem, the second coming of Christ. Christ comes to the angels and he destroys the beast and the false prophet and thrown into the lake of fire, which is Jerusalem. Um, and the, you know, the armies are defeated. And he's talking about the 12 tribes of Israel who rebelled against Christ. They are destroyed. And then it says in Revelation 20 that Satan is then bound for a thousand years. And then the resurrection of the the dead happens. Only those who were martyred, those who did not worship the beast, only they were resurrected. Those who were beheaded for the testimony of Christ. Now, on when Jesus died on the cross, there was a resurrection in Matthew 27. It said the Old Testament saints were raised from the dead. But from the Bible, you see that none of them we know were, you know, they did not refuse to worship the beast. Because worshiping the beast was only in the time of Revelation. We, we know that the, worst, the beast there was the old covenant system the you know the religious beast uh, the Pharisees and the political beast you know the King Herod and the, the other kings of Israel and we know that Jesus said that the martyrs or the witnesses in Acts chapter 1 are those martyrs are the church it's made mostly the church and the church was persecuted in that 40 years between 30 and 70 AD and they most of them perished you know, when you read the scriptures you see most of them died 
and very few of them remained alive until the second coming. So therefore the resurrection of the martyrs had to be at 70 AD or just before that uh, and it could not have been at the cross. And then it says that Satan is bound for a thousand years and at their reign those martyrs who were resurrected reign with Christ on earth for a thousand years. Now if you look at the history of Israel, in 70 AD was the first Jewish-Roman war. So the second coming was that Jewish-Roman war when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple. One million Jews died and then the rest of those who were alive were taken as prisoners, taken as slaves and scattered throughout the, uh, the lands. And basically from that time onwards, Israel was submitted to, Israel, to Rome. And in Revelation 19, it says that Jesus, when the second coming, he says, he comes uh, and he smashes the nations with a rod of iron. The word nations there can mean tribes of people. So basically he smashed those 12 tribes of Israel, Israel with a rod of iron through that Roman Empire. The Roman Empire there, as I mentioned before, uh, the Roman emperor who did it was Titus. And Titus, his, turn, his, his title was not the son of God because his father, Vespasian, was called God by the Romans. So it's almost like Titus came in the, uh, you know, in the in the symbol of in the symbol of Christ to destroy those uh, Israelites who rebelled against Rome. But the thing is that for from from 70 AD to 132 AD there was a time of great peace in the land. Israel had submitted completely to Rome, and I believe that was a thousand year reign of Christ when Jesus was ruling those twelve tribes with a rod of iron, and they were not they were in submission. If Jesus' second coming was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, then therefore the Roman rule over the Israelites had to be his reign. Now at the end of that, in AD 132, you had a man called Simon bar Kokhba, who deceived the Israelites, and he brought all these Israelites from all over the lands, and they attacked the Romans again in Jerusalem. Now in Revelation 20, it says, After the thousand years, Satan is loosed from the abyss and he is allowed to deceive the nations and gather them from all corners of the earth and, and attack the beloved city of God and then fire comes down from heaven and destroys uh, those people and then Satan is thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet were earlier thrown. So that clearly tells me that you know it's this the, the final you know that war of Gog and Magog was something that happened after 70 AD. It cannot be 70 AD. And therefore, when I look at it, that you know, when I look at history, I look at that that final Jewish-Roman war was 80, 132 to 136, and what happened is that uh, half a million Jews were killed and Israelites were killed. The Roman Emperor Hadrian actually was far more vicious than uh, Emperor Titus, and this time he indulged in genocide, actually killing a lot of Jews and basically destroying them off the map. And then he renamed the city of Jerusalem to a, a I forgot, Alia Capitolina. They renamed Jerusalem. They destroyed all the religious uh, rich, all the religious items in Jerusalem. Completely destroyed all traces of the Jewish religion. And he barred Jews and Christians from entering Jerusalem. That's how severe it was. So it's almost like what happened in 780 was really finished in 8132, 136. And that I believe is the end of the thousand years. And that's when the resurrection. Of the, in Revelation 20, it says that then the old heaven and passed away, and uh, then you have the uh, the judgment of the wicked. Because in Revelation 20, the first resurrection in 70, it says only the martyrs are resurrected, only the righteous are resurrected, and upon them the, the second death has no power, and the second death is the lake of fire. So, that second resurrection is like the re resurrection only of the wicked, because you know the Old Testament saints were resurrected in Matthew 27 at the, at the cross. So it's almost like there are three resurrections. But the problem is now, the problem with this again, is that in all throughout the scriptures you have the resurrection being a single event on a single day. And this is why I have a problem that the Bible, there's a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of contradictions, and, and many times we try to kind of make it work, try to, you know, uh, make it work to our beliefs, and more and more I see this and you know I, I, can, I kind of see this and I see that there's a lot of problems with the Bible and Christianity in a whole and yes although I, what I believe is in very accurate it's very accurate about you know the picture of the Bible is very accurate but still there are these things and my final conclusion is that you know what there is no more judgment whatever it is it's all over uh, the Bible is all about Israel and their covenants Jesus came to save them from the law 
whether the resurrection happened or not we don't really don't know but you know if it didn't happen and you know futurism is complete nonsense because they completely ignore the words of christ they ignore the time statements and they make that a total mockery and then obviously the the church today has no power as nothing like what jesus said nothing like the biblical church obviously we know that christianity ended somewhere in the first century if it even really existed all right but whatever the bible is and i believe god is not speaking to any of us through the bible he's not commanding anything to us we are not under the law and my experience my personal experience which i believe more than more in that than in a bible that was never written to me the bible is about israel is about the old covenant it's about all their covenants it's got nothing to do with any of us today the god that i believe in is unconditional love and that goes against what the bible says yes i believe jesus removed the law and i believe it's because of him alone that we are righteous we are born right jesus came to remove the law to show us that we are righteous you know when god created adam he was perfect in spirit and it's the same to today we are perfect in spirit perfect righteous and blameless perfect without any flaw yes we are created in this imperfect flesh in this world and i believe the answer the, the you know the reason for that is for us to to learn about this unconditional love of god to learn about that through this lesson of life that we go through and that's what that has been my the thing that i've learned in my life through this journey of religion you know in the beginning i knew god without knowing the bible i didn't know anything about religion i just knew god as my loving dad who took care of me who answered my prayer who loved me and who never told me about sin you know never told me about confessing my sin he never told me about hell or all the afterlife he never told me about all those things he just blessed me with my earthly needs and he never told me about accepting jesus or going to the church or doing anything but when i went into religion um i had to confess my sins repent you know pray fast carry the cross follow jesus you know try to speak in tongues try to you know be more obedient try to be a better person try to grow spiritually try to please god by faith surrender my life get baptized speak in tongues take the lord's supper trying to be holy trying to walk the narrow path and all this nonsense right and eventually i realized that i went into depression because i couldn't do all these things i couldn't please god and that's when at the, at the lowest moment of my life god revealed to me miraculously healing me of some sicknesses that he said that i was righteous and perfect without any effort of mine and that's the true god that i believe in the unconditional love of daddy god and that's all i want to tell you my friends you know whatever the bible is you know my bible investigation has brought me back to full circle that you know what the truth is only this that god is your daddy he loves you you are righteous you are perfect you are blessed you are spiritually perfect you are you are spiritually righteous you are righteous perfectly and completely and god loves you the way you are and that's all my friend that is the good news that i have to share with you take care dad he loves you everybody so that was matthew simon and uh a very very nice presentation um so many good powerful truths in there spoken well and clear um obviously i'd agree i'd agree with most of it sorry that was a notification there let me close that out um you know definitely agree with him on so many things and and he's got a nice way of presenting it um obviously where i would you know sort of disagree would be the idea that you know because of Christ removing the law that we are somehow now righteous you know i see christ work completely as israel completely for israel with no other ramifications whatsoever um i guess i'm you know pretty dogmatic on that point um but you know that also goes hand in hand with the fact that i kind of see this as an io myth <clears throat> based on the lack of evidence and historical accounts for all these things and everything um so i think that you know god is unconditional love for sure i'm right with him on that um based upon what i felt that day and and you know what the experience of experiences of others non-christian many non-christians um have felt that day or have felt in their experiences as well it's all about unconditional love right and like he said you know before he had even picked up a bible and read the bible he knew god you know he believed in god he um had a relationship with god god provided for him and and he had peace with that god but then when he picked up the bible you know he sort of started losing that you know and trying to work it out and fit it in and i totally can relate to matthew on many many things 
um, especially that one, you know, because when I uh, had that moment, I was just in perfect peace and, you know, and I could have lived that way forever, man. If I didn't jump into the Bible and start trying to become all religious and figure the Bible out and put myself in it and figure out how I could fit into it, man, I probably would have maintained that level of joy and peace right up until now. Um, and, you know, as I told my mom in that, that sort of, um, you know, fiery exchange we had yesterday where she was pleading the blood of Israel's savior over me, um, I uh, told her, I said, you know, ever since pulling myself out of this nonsense, I've, um, I've gained that peace back, you know, like my life is good again. I'm happy. I'm at peace. Um, my relationships are better with people. Um, you know, and it's just, it's just a lot easier to not be consumed in and with that religious system, which when you really boil it down, had nothing to do with me anyway. So, uh, yeah, folks, that's probably all I got for today. I just wanted to let you hear, uh, Matthew Simon. Um, I will put a link to this under the video, uh, in the comments in case anybody wants to, uh, check out some of the comments because some people did comment there. Um, and he got, he got a few haters, but he got a lot of love on it. And, um, you know, Matthew's crowd is, is a lot, a lot, um, different than my crowd in that Matthew has been a universalist teacher for a long time. And he, you know, he's always taught about universal love and God loving all people and everything through Jesus, of course, in the past. Um, but now, you know, now he's coming IO. So these universalist minded, you know, people and his universal universalist audience, is now seeing this and it probably jives a lot better with what they uh, believe because of course they believe that, you know, God loves everybody. So this is a lot easier to, to understand um, when you sort of eliminate and remove yourself from Israel's law, curse, death narrative um, and, and start seeing God for what he is. And that's just a being that exists above all religious uh, presuppositions and systems. And, um, and that's pretty much pretty much the gist of it folks so i hope you enjoyed it i hope you got a lot out of it um and uh yeah it's always good to have other speakers speaking about io especially clear uh speakers and um and intelligent ones and if you're an io guy out there and and you you know you you have the wisdom you get it you understand it i know there's a lot of you out there okay i know not a lot of you comment um, but I see, you know, the subscriptions, man, I'm a, I'm a full blown IO channel and I have 350 people that are subscribed. Um, so, you know, if, if you're an IO guy and if you get it and you, you enjoy it and you like the clarity that it gives, um, and you want to share that, I urge you, you know, take a step out, um, and, and make a channel, you know, it doesn't cost anything. You can do it at your leisure. Um, but make just make a channel and put up little uh, little videos, you know, whenever you want. Audios, videos, it won't cost you a penny. All right. The only thing that this costs me is time, which I don't have a lot of, but I enjoy it, so I do it. Um, and that's pretty much it, man. I, I was telling uh, Shani, uh, Rob Shannon, recently that uh, he should, because he sent me a couple clips of him speaking on the gifts and how nobody has the gifts anymore. Um, and how people claim to have the gifts, but nobody has the gifts, right? None of us witnessed the gifts. I mean, that was a huge part of the gospel, right? They were confirming what they were preaching and confirming what they were saying by doing gifts, by, by doing, you know, supernatural shit in front of people, by healing people, by raising people, by speaking in tongues, you know? And so nobody does that anymore, right? You have to go to like one of those huge crusades where they're up on stage and, you know, that's where the Holy Spirit comes, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't like to come to you know, just like, you know, a few people gathered together and heal somebody. He likes to do it in front of 20,000 people who all have uh, their hands in their pockets, you know, pitching into the offering bucket. That's where he enjoys coming. Um, but yeah, none of that happens anymore. So my buddy Rob sent me these couple clips of him just kind of messing around in his, in his truck, um, giving a short, you know, two to three minute teaching on, you know, why nobody has the gifts and why this is a huge proof um, that nobody has the Holy Spirit today and nobody, you know, is, is one of the elect and the gospel's irrelevant. And I told him, I said, dude, get a YouTube channel going, man. Just, just do it. You know, put these little short clips. Um, you can call them shanty, setting them straight, you know, whatever you want to call them, but just put them out there because, oh, and the other thing, if you're going to do it, label it Israel only. Okay. That's one thing I learned when I was talking to, uh, Mr. Fruit's dad is that if you're going to, uh, do a topic, you want to always make sure that the the main keywords of your of your you know theory, I guess, are in your title because when people search for that 
on YouTube, they're going to need to find it. And the first thing that they, they search is the titles of these videos. So, um, you know, tags and everything are important too, which I most of the time do. Sometimes I forget to put the tags in, but, um, you know, having that Israel only in, in the video title is big because people can search and find it. So, uh, yeah, I just urge you get out there, do it, make some videos, get yourself a little channel going, give yourself a, a little side hobby for when you're bored. Uh, and whenever something comes to mind and you want to share it, just upload something, man. People will be grateful. But anyways, I've hit an hour. I've gone far enough. I hope you all have a wonderful Monday. And we'll be back another day, another time, another place, and another rhyme. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Folks, my bad. I forgot to ask. If you liked the video, if you enjoyed it, please give it a like. Give it a thumbs up. And that's all I got. Have a good day.